pleasant good afternoon to our viewers. Thank you for the patience and for joining us here today. I would like to say thank you and welcome to the Honorable Philip J. Pierre. Welcome to Watch Radio NYC and welcome to Brooklyn, New York. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And very You're happy to be here. <laughs> and it's, and we, we were happy to have you here. Hopefully at the end of this discourse, um, our viewers will get a little bit more of a clear understanding as to where the opposition stand in terms of, of helping run our country and um, taking things back to, uh, I guess, some sort of normalcy as it pertains to the everyday viewing, you know? So this is the goal here at the end of the day. And um, as I stated to y'all viewers earlier, y'all have an opportunity to ask um, a question or two after. We, I'm asking that you use your discretion. And, and of course, at the end of every um, question, our objective is to remain respectful, irrespective of whether you agree with the answer given here today or not. So again, uh, let me officially welcome you to Watch Radio. We are the face of St. Lucia, the only St. Lucian-based radio station here in Brooklyn, New York. Sure. And, and so it's a pleasure for us to have you. So can you tell the people a little about yourself? Well, first of all, I, I want to thank you for having me. I want to thank the people at Watch Radio for having me. I'm sure that I would be, I'm very happy to, to be able to speak to St. Lucians in, in New York and, and, and in, in, in the greater United States. Well, I'm here basically to speak to St. Lucia and to have a conversation with St. Lucia about the solutions, about what's happening in St. Lucia. I want to make it clear that I am in a position, but I have a vested interest in St. Lucia doing well. We, right. not wa we want St. Lucia to prosper. We want St. Lucia to uh, develop. We want St. Lucia to grow. So our job in the opposition is not to stop anything or to destabilize or to obstruct. Correct. What we want to do is that we want to see things done properly for the benefit of the majority of solutions. Okay. That, is, that is basically what we stand for. Okay. So, um, guys, I'm going to ask y'all a favor uh, to oh, go ahead and please like and share the video, invite somebody over. Again, y'all are getting this once, maybe once in a lifetime opportunity. So this is the time to uh, utilize it and make good use of it. So, um, without further ado, I'm going to move into our agenda for today so we can get the ball rolling. Um, as a very seasoned politician, I have to wish you well, um, congratulate you, rather, on, on your journey thus far as a politician. I think you're one of the most accomplished politicians um, in our times. So what would you say, as the opposition leader, has been one of your biggest challenges faced thus far? Well, I'll tell you something. I have represented my constituency for, from, from 1997. My constituency is Cassius East. I've won five times. I topped the polls, I think, twice. But my biggest challenge is being able to give to people, to deliver to people what I know they want, mm -hmm. but the resources are limited. Right, so right. We have, we have limited resources, but we have, we have many needs. True. And, and that's my biggest challenge, to be able to give to people what I know they deserve and what they need, but because of the limited resources, we have difficulty in doing that. I would say that's my biggest challenge. Okay, okay. Okay, so let's piggyback to June 6th of 2016. Um, when the SLP lost the general elections to UWP. I mean, from the campaigning and, and all of the e events leading up, leading up to the elections, it, it somehow seemed that SLP were, were the ones in position to reclaim, to reclaim their seats. But um, as the hours went by and, and we, we listened to the results, you know, for some, it was very gut-wrenching, and, and I mean, for a lot, they got the shocker of their lives that y'all had lost the seat to um, the elections, per se, to 
the UWP 11-6. Um, yeah. Can you perhaps um, explain or enlighten the people a bit as to what you think contributed to that loss? Well, I'll tell you something. We were very surprised. The polls showed that we were winning, but we were very surprised. But I think what really happened is that people were promised many things. Okay. And I must tell you, things were tight. We just come from a, a, a situation where, where the country was in a, in a kind of a spiral because the whole world was in promise at the time. Right. So, so the, the, the world situation impacted on St. Lucia. So things were rough. Mm -hmm. And St. Lucians were, were made many promises, like the eventual taken out of vats. Right. That, you know, the, there was a saying that money in your pockets. You understand? Right, right. So, so what happened is that St. Lucians believe that, listen to me, things are tight. Mm -hmm. The unemployment, particularly among young people, was, was, was very high, right. particularly among young people. I'll agree with that. So, and they thought that, listen to me, let's try something else. And the then government made many promises, promises of jobs, promises of investments, promises to remove VAT, promises to lower licenses, to lower taxes. And the people said, okay, things are tight. We cannot wait any longer. The electorate was very impatient. All those things had begun to improve. The electorate was impatient. Listen to me, let's give somebody, somebody else a chance. Okay. I thought that was the main reason okay. that the country wanted, wanted something different because mm -hmm. they thought that personally they would have benefited more if the government had changed. Okay. So basically, just to, to really summarize all of what you, you, you're saying is that the election was lost to UWP based off the promises that UWP had made to those people. Yes. And having a frustrated bunch of, of individuals, particularly young people, young people who, who were unemployed. unemployment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you 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 decided that. Um, sorry, what you're saying basically is that in in the closing hours of of the general elections, what decided the fit was uh, the the young people saying, you know what, we've we've given uh, SLP five years to prove themselves. And, and we frustrated, we were not getting anywhere, we were unemployed, still sitting on the block. And so we were going to the polls with the mindset that we're going to give that things will a, change. New, a, new, a new, we're going to take a uh, fresh 17 mm. and give them an opportunity to see what they can do. Is that what you're saying? I think so. Okay. Because they, they did not fully realize that the economy was difficult and right. things were improving. You see, okay. things were improving, mm -hmm. but it was taking time. Right. And I think they said, listen to me, all these promises, VAT reduction, mm -hmm. no VAT, let's go and let's change. So would you, say, would you say that the SLP did not do enough during the campaigning season to reassure that uh, the, the people, particularly the, the young ones, that um, we know that we, we are struggling. It is not only a St. Lucian thing. Um, it is something that's affecting the entire world. Do you think that you all did enough to educate the people as it pertains to, to the struggles around the world? No, I think our messaging was poor. Okay. I think we assumed that people knew what was happening. We assumed that people would understand that we were in a crisis, a world crisis. And St. Lucia was not the only country. Okay. We assume that people will understand that we had reduced a deficit from 9% to 3.4%. Mm -hmm. We assume that. We assume that people would see what is happening and they would understand that things are improving. Okay. But okay. probably our messaging wasn't what it ought to be. And I must tell you, because I said something, when you are in these positions, you believe people know what, what you are doing. But right. really, they, they do not know. True. So you must always rem you must constantly remind them. I'll tell you something. We built 23 bridges mm -hmm. in five years. 23 bridges. Okay. We did. The, the country had been had been under strain because of Hurricane Thomas. We right. did that. We uh, rebuilt the, the country. We started two new hospitals, mm -hmm. right? St Jude Hospital and the Owen King Hospital. Right. All these things, right? But people <laughs> did not think that it was enough. 
right. because they were promised money in their pockets. Okay. And that, that, I think that's the basic problem. Okay. Money in your pocket, so regardless, I'll get money, I'll pay less VAT, so I'm changing. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, at the end of the day, um, I will give you a fish rather than teach you how yeah. to fish and is I'm what ready. officially decided the elections in the closing hours. I really believe that. Okay. But okay. I'll tell you what, I respect the will of the people. Right. And when we lost the, the, the election, I personally congratulated uh, the Prime Minister. Okay. I told him, you've won, mm -hmm. congrats. Right. You govern the country and do it for the majority of solutions. But True. that doesn't mean that we must stay quiet. That doesn't mean right. we must allow the country to go in a situation where there's, there's vindictiveness and lack of accountability and lack of transparency. True. True. It means that the government must govern. But the opposition and the people must remain as watchdogs to, en to ensure that the government does what is right and they do things for the majority of solutions. True. But we do not want solutions to fail. As I've told you before, we're not obstructionists. We want the country to progress. Mm -hmm. And we're going to assist the government if we have to. We've said to the government, let's work together on crime. Right. We said that to the government because it's, it's not in our vested interest to, for, country, for our country to fail. We True. really want our country True. to develop for True. the majority of all, for the benefit of all. Right. I mean, um, since you brought up crime, I think uh, we closed off the year with about approximately 60, 60 murders. murders. The most in the history of St. Lucia. Okay. Do you, think, do you think that enough is being done to combat crime? And should the, the ruling government reach out to your party and ask for a joint effort in finding a solution to, to um, curbing crime, do you think that you all will be open to working with them on that? Well, I'll tell you something. We've made it public, we've, we've said in public that we're going to work with the government for any meaningful effort to curb the crime situation in St. Lucia. Okay. But, but I'll tell you what, our supporters are telling us that when you're in government, these guys blamed you for crime. Everything that happened, it, it, it was because of some minister, because right. of Kenny Anthony, because of La Corbinia, because of me. But we do not believe that crime should ever be politicized. True. We think that crime is a problem that affects everyone, could affect you, could affect me. Right. So we stand willing to work at the government in any meaningful effort, on the line of the word meaningful, to curb the issue. But I, I'll also add quickly add that it's not an easy problem to solve. True. Crime is multifaceted. I won't sit here and tell you, if you get into government, we'll solve all the crimes the problem. Right. In Lucia. Nor will I ever make crime a political issue. But I think the government should retract the statement that they would make Lucia safer. Right. I think I think the government needs to retract and the government needs to to pledge like us that they will never politicize crime as they did in the last elections. Right, right. I mean uh just 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 looking just looking at um or keeping abreast, you know, with the news all over. I mean, crime is something that not any one particular person or 17 group of people can control. And I agree. So, so I mean, I agree when you said it should not be made a political, a political thing. Issue, and rather, I mean, all efforts, whether it be from the public, um, the opposition, even people out of St. Lucia who can weigh in and find ways to go ahead and find solutions maybe it'd be from the, the from from the little ones you know from mm -hmm. infant to, to find some ways to curb i think that would be um the best way that we have a chance in in combating crime and we will support any meaningful initiative the word is meaningful right right <laughs> that's what we will support meaningful right yeah. so um the word victimization has somehow become a norm i mean it's been thrown around loosely, I, I would say, by either side of, of, of the party. I mean, if it's SLP in, in, in power, then we have our UWP supporters saying that they are being victimized or vice versa. Um, I mean, uh, maybe I should, I, I'm going to ask you, um, who do you think has done the most victimizing as, as it <laughs> pertains to... <laughs> I'll tell you something. You must look at, um, you know, you must deal with things with empirical evidence, right? right. Now, I, 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 I know politics is emotion, but there must be empirical evidence. We have to do things empirically. What is the evidence? Right, let, let, right. Let's start with the evidence. There was a nice program. 
and and, and I, I I don't want to bring local politics into this business. I mean, but, it's okay. We but hear it it's too. it's an imp- I, I want to deal with the facts. Right. Not emotion. Not what you think, but with facts. True. There was a program called the Nice Program, mm-hmm. where over a thousand people were employed. They True. did several things. Right, right. The most important part was this, they they took care of the elderly. There was a home care program. They they repaired they they fixed fields. They repaired fields. They they, they maintained fields. Sorry, they worked as school princip- as school assistants for the principals okay. because, the, because the principals in the primary school they had no assistant so they had to okay. answer the phone and do the typing but we they, they were they were they were so assistants. it's like they were doing everything on their own the principals in primary schools oh so okay. employees were a nice program and they helped the, 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 the they helped the principals of the schools they worked at the hospitals they were hospital aides they were health aides they helped in the hospital so the nurses the nurses could do more serious things while while they took care of the patients etc they worked in places like the transport board to take care of licenses they worked in the immigration department to help even to, to get their passports they worked in that they worked in all this in all these areas of, of endeavor okay. when they were campaigning the opposite the then government said we're going to make the nice program nicer <laughs> all right okay <laughs> so, uh, now when, when people hear things are going to be nicer, you know, that's human nature. Right, we aspire right, right. for better things. That's how true, we are as human true, beings. True. That's what we have to do. So we lost. Mm-hmm. Then the government stopped the NICE program. They dismissed every one of the workers. And when the, the opposition questioned that, one prominent government minister said, if you're crying, you've just begun to cry. Ooh. Now that is on the record. It's not something I am saying because I want to say bad things. It's on the record. Right. If you're crying, you've just begun to cry. That's one. And another minister said, it doesn't really matter because 90% of these people were supporters of the Labour Party. Okay. That's on the record. Now you can tell me they didn't mean what they say. You can say, true. but that's on the record. True. True. Now, what you're saying is that is state-sponsored victimization right and all these people were indeed sent home and they started the home care program again but only with selected people so most of the people who were working on the home care program and these people took care of elderly people there was an affinity towards them and the elderly people these people lost their jobs and a new set of people t- took over so that is documented that I have empirical evidence for that. Mm-hmm. So that is not that is not right. And I'm going to say something to you: the 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 party that I lead, we will never engage in that kind of behavior, because we believe that people have a right to have their own political affiliation, true, and live in a country, and because we live in in a very small country. I'll tell you something also: the government sent home the cabinet secretary, not sent home; they transferred him, and now that is. That is the object of some case in court. The cabinet secretary is the head of, of the civil service. You understand? You see, what, what, what happens is that the government is in a rush in that they believe that once someone did not vote for them or did not support them, the person will destabilize them, okay. which, is, which, which, which is not the case. So True. empirical evidence shows that this government has really done some harm to people who they perceived as supporters of the Labour Party. Okay. okay. So th- this is empirical. This is factual. Anything else is speculation. And sure. I can go through a, whole, a long list of, 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 of this, but I, I don't want to, to bore you with that kind of thing. But fact is that victimization is bad and government should stop it because the country is too small mm-hmm. to divide it in half. Because you guys what happens? You'll always find people who are labor and people who are UWP. So True. you can't divide the country. We, 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 we need to nurture all the talent in the country. You cannot divide it True. like that. You know, uh, We understand supporters will want to be treated as supporters. But that, that blatant division and that discrimination because you're not a supporter of the government must stop. I agree. I agree. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, if the general elections are over as one people we should find common grounds to um 
make our country be uh, better. And so, at the end of the day, the party. You but I'll, I'll tell you something, not... which is even which, which is which is very bad, and something which I intend to change if I become prime minister. Mm -hmm. Parliamentary representatives can do nothing in their constituencies if you are in opposition. Oh. <laughs> now, well. I have represented my constituency for 20 years, since 1997. I've won five elections. As we speak, I cannot get a drain cleaned in my constituency. Is that because of a lack of funding? No, 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 no. no? Because when you're in opposition, you just have absolutely no say in your constituency. Oh. Now, that, that's something we will stop. Okay. When we get back in government, we have to stop it. True. Because you, because people vote for representatives to do things for them, true, and literally, true. I can do nothing in my constituency because I'm not in government. I have to call a minister to clean a drain. There's so absolutely me, no even, no avenue when I get in the, in the constituency. So is that something that has been go, um, it ongoing? It has been. Or? It has been ongoing. But when we were in government, there was something called the constituency development program mm -hmm. which was money from the taiwanese right. that specified should be used in the constituencies okay. and opposition constituencies got some form, form of, of assistance but but right now there's nothing literally nothing now even if it's something that's practiced before it's about time that we change it mm -hmm. and we're going to change it when you get back into government you can't have a parliamentary a parliamentary rep and that is why you see there's such that that eagerness to become a minister and to get into government because if you're not in government if your party is not in power you can literally do nothing for your people mm -hmm. and wh what has happened is a trend has developed that the opposition candidates that you defeated in, in, in the elections is given all the resources oh, okay. <laughs> and is given all the resources so then the opposition candidate the person you, you defeated right can do things that you can't do and you elected <laughs> you so okay. th th this is a new thing that entered the politics which we, we we will stop okay um i mean there are there are people who are listening who may who may not be aware or familiar with um some of the accomplishments and you said that um you don't think that y'all did a good enough job as it pertains to um, educating the public about some of the things that you all did or the message was not clear enough. I mean, this is a good enough platform where we have people both here and back home who's listening right now. So can you go ahead and, and um, share with them some of the accomplishments that the um, St. Lucia Labour Party accomplished when they was in office back in 2011 to 2016? Okay. Um... Well, I could go to 1997, but I guess, <laughs> I guess that, that, that's going to be a bit too far. But right, I want right. to make two notable, two notable things within 1997, mm -hmm. between 1997 and 2006. Universal primary school education. Uh -huh. And I want, to, I want to underline the word primary school education, because you may not know that, but there was a time when children went to school half for half of the day. Oh, I'm not familiar. Yes, you may not. They went to school, oh. in the primary school for half, half of a day. They went from to one from one to to, to four or five okay. so half of the day these children were home unsupervised sure. and people have forgotten that universal primary school education right then we did universal secondary school education that'll be the first one to tell you it's not perfect true it's need it needs to be refined it probably it even needs now to be looked into again because you find what has happened is that they there are kids who who are in the secondary school but they, but they can't do the so-called academic subjects right so they find themselves falling through the crap through, through, through the, the cracks, cracks. But, but the fact is every child can get a secondary school to go to and again, again i don't know if you remember that there was a time when i went to school or even after me where four thousand children wrote a common entrance examination four thousand mm -hmm. and there was places for only two thousand so 2,000 children were considered failures. How can a child 11 years be a failure? True. I think um, the thing is if they had failed common entrance, You've got it. They, they had nowhere to go. They or six form something, and then after six that, that was the and end, that was the end yeah, for them? Yeah. That was right. before we had the universal second school education. Now, how can an 11-year-old child be considered a failure? True. Can't happen. Right. So, and I, I'm going to tell you again, it needs refinement now. 
because things have changed, education has changed, but the fact is, every child in St. Lucia can get a secondary school to go to. That's a fact. It's not perfect, right. but it needs but it, it's there because we built five new secondary schools okay. to get children in school. If you look at playing facilities, when I grew up, I grew up with Marshall Grounds and Mindy for the Park, right? Our government built a state-of-the-art stadium, which unfortunately now is a hospital. Right. And we built the Darren Sammy Grounds that introduced international cricket to, to, to St. Lucia in the field of sports. Plus, Money purpose cost, etc. So I'm, I'm speaking about sports and education. In terms of infrastructure, we were the ones who who we completed the, the, the highway from from Castries to uh, 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 Latok, the Millennium Highway. We completed that. Mm -hmm. John Compton started it, we completed it. But we also did the West Coast Road. We improved nice. the Grosley Highway. And we were on the verge of, of improving it in that term, but we, we, we lost. Okay. In terms of infrastructure, we, developed, mm -hmm. we opened up, a, opened up Bon Séjour, opened up all these lands. All the lands by the stadium, opened up by us. The infrastructure, right? Now, in terms of investment, between in the years 2009, 2006, when I was Minister of Tourism, I, 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 shouldn't, I shouldn't put a plug for myself, but we had the, <laughs> the largest amount of Hotels been built in the country. Mm -hmm. Hotel investment was, 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 was at its highest. In terms of commerce, we expanded the Bureau of Standards to ensure that local manufacturers had a solution standard mark where they right. could compete in, mm -hmm. the, in the international arena. We gave the most scholarships, particularly scholarships to Cuba, so children of regular people, people who couldn't afford are doctors and engineers and and engineers and doctors. If right. you go to the hospital now, most of the doctors there are trained in Cuba. Most of them. Because the initiative of having of having these scholarships from Cuba. Most was of there, the was there also a nursing program? There's a nursing program where three hundred people when 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 well you you well you well tuned. Three hundred people went to study nursing and right. then they learned Spanish. Mm -hmm. So they, 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 they learned a foreign language. Then in the engineering program, engineering assistance all the engines, the Ministry of Infrastructure, are, are Cuban trained. So, people who never, because of their income status, would ever dream of being a doctor or an engineer or an economist because of the Labour Party's scholarship program, because of the fact we gave study leave with pay right. to as many people as possible, mm -hmm. because of that, they, they, they became, they became doc doctors and, and engineers, etc. Mm -hmm. so, that, so that's between 1997 and 2006. In 2006, when there was Cricket World Cup, the economy grew by over 5%. 2006, there were all these projects on the ground, and we grew by 5% in 2006. And again, that is empirical evidence. It's not me saying it. Some of you can check the CDB, rec the CDB records. You can check the ECCB. You'll find that the country grew by over 5%. Right, right. So the evidence is the there evidence to is support there. what yeah, you're yeah. saying. To mid 2006 to 2011, there was the worldwide uh, 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 recession. United States everywhere. Mm -hmm. When he came back in the government, we found a country that was on the verge of going to the IMF. The deficit on current accounts was over 8%, nearly 9%. You may know that Greece went to the IMF with a deficit of less than 9%. Right. We were at 9%. Unemployment was about 25%. Among young people, some people believe it was 50%. Mm -hmm. That was the situation in 2011. In 2011, there was no investment, no new hotels for building in Lucia between 2006 and 2011. And that is fact. I'm not saying to you it's because of the, of the government. I'm stating facts. Right. So when we came back in, 20, in 2016, that is what we found. Okay. We found a country where, where there had been a serious struggle when Sir, Sir John Compton died. Mm -hmm. There was a struggle for leadership. You, you, you're right. Aware of that, yes, right? yes. Right. And we found this but that country. I think there was what? Something called the five, the, five something? No, or, the, no, the seven. It was seven? The, the, I think it was... Something seven, I can't recall. Yeah, I know. Point, I know there was a bit of controversy yeah. going on, and it's mm, like yeah. the 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 party was then either was divided the in two or yes. yeah. 
and to his credit, King kept it together. You understand? Mm -hmm. And they, they went through 2016. So when it came to 2016, that's what we inherited. So we found a country where the current account uh, deficit was high, the GDP ratio was high, unemployment was high. It still is high. Okay. It's, it's got to, to be lower, we mm -hmm. admit, but that's the fact that it was high. When we left in 2016, we had reduced that current account deficit to about 3.4%. Right, mm -hmm. but we had to do that. We had to implement some 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 harsh measures. True, and True. VAT was one of these measures. VAT we had VAT at fifteen percent, but because of the imposition of VAT, we could have reduced that current account uh, uh, deficit to three point four percent. We increased licenses, but do you know? You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised to know that it still costs less than a dollar a day to drive the roads in Saint Lucia. With a car, I, I want to listen to care what I'm saying <laughs> because I mean, yeah. you you live here and you pay the toll, etc. Right. In Saint Lucia, it costs less than a dollar a day to a drive a motor a motor car in Saint Lucia. Less than a dollar a day. Right, and that is after the increase. Okay. Right. After the VAT increase. No, after VAT and after increasing licenses. Okay. We had we had, we had increased car licenses. Right. Car right. Yeah. Licenses for what do you call road taxes? Mm -hmm. Right. But it still costs less than a dollar a day to drive a car in Saint Lucia. Right. We had to, so we took some harsh we took some measures which were harsh. Right. Investment had just begun to come back. If you come to Saint Lucia now, you see there's a 500 room hotel called the uh, uh, Royalton Hotel. I think I'm somewhat familiar with yes, that. Yes, that's to the extreme north of the country. It's in the, that, I think it, it was a hotel, it was the old Holiday, not Holiday Inn, it was, it was a hotel that was developed by, um, by some Canadian investors. Okay. It's got 500 rooms now that, that came under our, our watch. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it, it, it got opened by, by this government. Okay. There's a Harbour Club Hotel. Which is lower low down near the the Pope site. Okay. When last have you been to Lucia? It's a long time, Maybe. right? Not 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 that long. No. <laughs> like what? Maybe uh, uh, a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that that's too long, right? <laughs> no, true. So. It's not long. Even if I see a couple of years, it's not that many years. Ah, okay. Know? All right. So we we so the investment had that begun to return, right? Mm -hmm. So the country was on the verge of of coming from a recession okay into slow growth and into more sustainable growth that's what was inherited in 2016 as, as and that's we, empirical as a fact okay as we on the, the the um subject of hotels i know there was a hotel that was um supposed to have been built somewhere in monorepo um after you leave bodily going Prale. down so oh, okay. what became of this hotel that was a failed investment okay and, and it was very sad again that is why we we must be so careful when we get involved in foreign direct investment with people that we don't know true and hence the reason why we are sounding caution about the dsh program the dsh project hence mm -hmm. the reason mm -hmm. because the prale was fantastic ideas it came it came under us yes we gave all the incentives they, they, they asked for, and it has become the failed investment. That's why you must be so, we must be very careful as a government and as a country when we are leasing or we are giving up large areas of land to foreign, to foreign investors, hopefully for them to build hotels, etc. Mm -hmm. We have to do all the due diligence. We have to be careful because St. Lucia only has X amount of land. Land right. is not an True. infinite uh, resource. We must be very careful what we do of our lands. And here's our point of departure as far as the DSH program is concerned. Okay. I mean, um, I'm not going to jump into DSH right now. I'm, I'm, I'm going <coughs> to just... Um, you, you mentioned that you all did quite a bit as it pertains to infrastructure. And um, one of the things I think um, that a lot of people would, would want to know is um, about St. Jude's. I mean, I think um, it was back in, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, it, it is about nine years since um, St. Jude's started the unfortunate 20, 2010. 
Right. Since the unfortunate incident with St. Jude's, I think it was approximately about a a year and a half um, after the um, currently ruling UWP was still in office. And then they lost the elections to y'all. So y'all had an entire five Five years. years, But um, I mean, especially being that the the then ruling... um, uh, uh, Labour Party, the Prime Minister was representing the people of the South. I mean, to this very day, people would have thought that you would have come and completed the um, the hospital, the construction, and you also talked about Owen King, but I don't think any of those hospitals are currently in operations as they should. And can you explain to the people, I mean, there was quite a bit of funds that was either collected or monies donated. There were also items that were, were sent to St. Lucia in, in, to, in, in hopes of um, facilitating the hospital and seeing that it's up and running. Because, I mean, God forbid that something drastic was to happen, especially in the South, and, and the people are without, are without a hospital right now. So can you, can you educate the public and explain to the people what are some of the challenges that you all faced as it pertains to the construction, and why is it that to this day the people still do not have a hospital in the South? Okay, sure. First of all, I want to tell you that we are very concerned about the, hosp- about the St. Jude Hospital. But we need to get a few facts straight okay. about the St. Jude Hospital. True. When the St. Jude Hospital fire destroyed it, and some people lost their lives, God bless their, their, their souls. May they rest in peace. Yes. Um, everyone was panicking. Everyone, the government at the time, had to find something to do, had to find something. And the people would move to the, to the, to the, to stadium. the stadium. At that time, must understand that was an unforeseen circumstance. True, right. There was no money to build a new hospital. Mm-hmm. Not like the Owen King Hospital, the Owen King E Hospital, where there was money. There was a line of finance to build the Owen King Hospital. Okay. It was done by the, by, by the EU. So there was a line of finance. Okay. I want you to make the distinction and let's go through it slowly. Sure, no problem. St. Jude Hospital, there was no money. It wasn't on the cards at all. That was an unforeseen circumstance. True, right. The people moved to the stadium. At the time, the thinking was, let us repair what is left from the burnt out structure. Mm-hmm. Let's repair it. Right. So it was cleaned up, and the thinking was, we're going to repair it. At that point, people began to send money in. And I want to thank all of those in the United States who helped collect that funds, sent money for the rebuilding of reconstruction of St. Jude's. Then, a decision was taken that, listen, it doesn't make any sense to repair what's there. Let us build a new hospital on a new site. Mm-hmm. That, that decision was taken. But, but after it, 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 was, it was realized, that, listen to me, it will cost too much money to build a new hospital on a new site. Right. So let's go back and repair what's there. Mm-hmm. So when we came into government, we found the United Workers Party repairing what was there. Okay. Right? What so, so repair works had already commenced on the, the, on the United, Workers Party. United Workers yes. Party. But with no money, like, like is the situation up to now. Okay. So what happened is that we continued. And I want, you to go, I want us to go for that um, slowly. Sure. So that we can go through the, the, the steps. Because there's been a lot of emotion and misinformation. And let me tell you, I think that the people of the South need a new hospital. Mm-hmm. I think the doctors and nurses and patients are suffering at the stadium and we need to change it. I agree. I conquer. So, there was no money for the hospital. I want to repeat that. Because that is the, 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 that is the, the, the central point. We continued working on the hospital we never stopped work on the hospital because friendly governments were helping solutions were helping from abroad but the footprint of the hospital expanded mm-hmm. so instead of a repair now you find new new things are going right you understand folks are getting excited so new new, new things are happening True. things are not adequate so they're exp- expanding getting long so the footprint is is, is, in, is increasing mm-hmm. but there's no money right we went to taiwan 
and we got a loan of 20 million US dollars from Taiwan, a, a concessionary loan okay. to put into the hospital. When we had left government, $10 million from that money had been spent. So there's a loan of there's 10 million US dollars that can be accessed. Okay. Other countries helped. Mexico built something, etc. But the point is, we never stopped construction of the hospital. When the Republican Party got, got into government, there was a whole hue and cry about why didn't we finish the hospital. Mm -hmm. We could not because we didn't have money. Okay. But we never stopped. Right. But there's something that I don't think many people have have understood or any many people know. There is a document called an exit report on St. Jude Hospital where the engineers and the people involved wrote a document stating why the hospital wasn't completed and what has to be done to complete the hospital. Okay. That document was kept secret until the talk show host revealed it. So all the young cry about electrical wires, about things that there are no windows, and all this emotion that was that was about a place. The, the police were used to, to go into people's houses to, to get what it says, hospital material, etc. All these things were in a document. Okay. What had to be done to complete the hospital was in a document prepared by the engineers and the consultants who had worked there for the last seven years. And that's very important. Mm -hmm. These people were fired and never spoken to. So where you have, you complain about, that hasn't been done, you're accusable of corruption, you, and the document that says what had not been done, why it had not been done, and what ought to happen for it to finish, you conceal it. Okay. A document prepared by engineers who worked there for the last seven years and consultants. So they would be knowledgeable. Of course. Instead of doing that, you order an audit that costs one million dollars. Up to this day, the public have not been told the contents of that audit. Up to as I speak to you. It leaked again. You know, they are whistleblowers. So it leaked. <laughs> I mean, right. if, if documents leak from the Congress, much the same. So it leaked, right? So the public has an idea what was there. But up to today, the government has not tabled a document in Parliament. Parliamentarians do not know what's there. But all you have is accusations. This one will, 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 will be arrested. And the Prime Minister's last book about forensic, a forensic, all sorts of things. But a document, two documents. One, the handover report, which was prepared by the engineers and the consultants who worked on the project for the last six or seven years, has never been revealed to the public in, from official circles, nor the report of the $1 million audit has still not been revealed to the public from official circles. Okay. So, um, it was stated that as, as it stands, it makes no sense to continue work on, on the hospital. Why? To, to the extent something has to do with with the the, the size of the doors and and uh, and, that's and, and to you. all that is not is not so you're report. saying this is not this is not that's not case. true it's in a report lady t it's in a report you see and that is a strange thing and that's why you have to question the motives mm -hmm. all that is in a report a report first of all there was a thing that the vessel has no windows the report said <laughs> the report said and it's a pity i don't have it we'll have a time to go for the report because you would see all the things that were said about that the Baden hospital is in the report mm -hmm. by the engineers and the consultants okay you understand mm -hmm. so you have to question yourself why is that happening why and in the meantime St. Louis hospital continues no no work done now, if you know anything about construction, you would know when you close a building, it deteriorates. Okay. So, we don't know True. what's happening. Exactly. Now, but you find people say, okay, the question is, why did you finish the hospital? The, the answer is simple. We had no money. We did it with grant funds. And when we did get a loan to finish the hospital, we were out of government. The, the, the answer is simple. Okay. So, the... the, the 
problem back in 11 to 16 was that you all did not have the financial line of, of finance, finance in order to continue yes. the hospital. Not, no, we continued to, to complete it. To complete it. Yes. When you all did eventually get a loan, you said from the 20, Taiwanese, you all lost the election. You all lost the election. So the money is, 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 in, an account, is, there, is in an account somewhere, I would well, assume. I'll tell you what. The way the, 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 these things happen... The, the money comes in tranches. Mm -hmm. So we've got the first tranche of $10 million and you have to apply for the second tranche. Okay. Yeah. But so was the that applied $20 million for? loan had been approved by the Taiwanese. So was the additional $10 million applied for? I have for? no idea. Oh, so you would not know. These, these are not things that the government discusses with, with, with the opposition. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, but isn't there ways for you all to find out? if, if that well, Boy, the only way you can find out is through <laughs> whistleblowers. <laughs> and oh. one now again one would have expected you know things like and that is the kind of governance that i want to introduce in Lucia when you get back in the government things like things like hospitals things that impact directly on people's welfare because if you can afford it when you get sick you can fly and go to martinique or go to miami etc but the majority of people in St. Lucia cannot do that so one would expect something like that the government would call the opposition in the conference. This is me. Let's let's talk about St. Jude's. Mm -hmm. Right? First and also there are the Prime Minister, Orb Alva Baptiste, Orb Moses Jabatis, all of them represent the constituencies where the hospital is located. Right, right. So one would have thought that there'd be some dialogue. But that doesn't happen. You hear everything like everybody in the streets. So you had the accusations, you had a, nobody asked for any explanation. And even though it happened before, it's something that I want to change. I want to, to develop a culture of dialogue, a culture of consultation, a culture where the opposition gets intimately involved in affairs of the country. Politics is always politics. True. I'm not telling you I won't have, we'll have a system where there is no politics. Is politics mm -hmm. Politics has its, its, own, its own morality, it has its, its own dealings. But there are certain key things, like health, particularly something like St. Jude's. That's the only hospital in the South. Recently, there was a fire in the Sufre Hospital. Okay. Problems. Sufre also is fed, also feeds St. Oh, Jude's. Right. Something like that should not be made a political football. It should be discussed, and we shouldn't try to score points on an issue like that. Sure. If, if it is done before, it's wrong. And if it's done now, it's still wrong. And when people vote for governments, they don't vote for governments to continue what is wrong. True, true. They vote for governments to improve situations. So to make the point, you did it too. It's, it's, right. it's not a valid point. It's you, like tit for tat. Right, it's not a valid point. And that's something I, need, I want to change when you get into government. True. So you, you, you mentioned that there is the handover document and the other report the that other report, was... Yeah. Um, Commissioned by this government. That, and that's information I think that is that information that's accessible to the public. No, that's what I'm saying. Is <laughs> they are still secret. They only came oh, on so it's through, all kept secret. through whistleblowers. Oh. All you have is accusations. So if how how or what would be the 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 um the way to, to make this transparent i mean is there some law that's no there's not no there, there is not no so i guess it was paid by taxpayers money mm -hmm. and that is the level of accountability and transparency that we that that we're speaking about you have two documents the public only knows what's there because of whistleblowers and because of rumor and talk show hosts who have disclosed what's there but you do nothing about it and you just accuse people just accusations 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 you understand? And that is, is the problem we have. Okay. So, um, I mean, as it pertains to transparency and accountability, do you think that um, enough is being done in, in that aspect? I mean, there are a lot of things that, that happened back under the SLP administration. And I think there are things that continues to happen where, where the public does not know or can only go off what they say and, and they say. So, I mean, you said that one of the things you want to do is to change the, the tit for tat. To make the country more transparent, 
to improve the level of governance. Okay. The country has got to go to a higher level of governance, of accountability, of transparency. It's got to be a, it's got to be a country where 40% of the people do not feel alienated because the government is out of power. True. I'll, 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 I'll give you an example. Look at, it's the last thing I heard, they probably, must, they, they probably there are about 30,000 solutions in New York, in, in, in the United States. Some people say more. Maybe. Yeah, some, people, some people say more, actually. Some yeah. people think it's more, more like 60,000. Now, here's a rich source of money because you may not know or i'm sure you, you you know that jamaica one of jamaica's largest sources of foreign exchange comes from something called remittances from abroad right okay. money from the u.s from england that goes to jamaica there are communities in st lucia that survive only 90 percent from remittances from abroad because in the kind of families we have in 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 st lucia and jamaica when you're abroad you send something for your auntie right and your godchild <laughs> you know and your nene and, and your grandmother that. your grandma you must it's your it's your duty you think it's your duty right now here's a government is that is given a thousand acres of land to one man now i want to be clear that the labor party is not against foreign direct investments Okay. When the, the developer on the DSH program spoke to us first, it, he spoke to the Labour Party first when we were in government. Right. But the Prime Minister at, at the Prime Minister at the time thought that listen to me, that is too I mean he could have said it and probably won the election. Mm -hmm. He could have said, We'll have an investment for two point five billion dollars and the, the whole South will become the pearl of the Caribbean. He could have said so. Sure. But at that point, we thought, listen to me, this thing is too big. It's a thousand acres of land. And it wasn't a thousand acres of land that, that the developer wanted to buy, you know. And, I, and then you see, I want to make these things clear because I want when there is a response, that the response will be as accurate as it ought to be. That wasn't the developer said, listen to me. I want to buy a thousand acres of land. Then the market value, the market forces would, 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 would come to, to, to come to play. Land in that area by the beach, by Sandy Beach, that area costs probably about fifty dollars a square foot. That's prime real estate. So nobody wants to buy it. Buy it. That was land that was owned by the government through NDC that was handed over to a developer. For between 20 and 99 years so you've given that swath of land to one man mm -hmm. to develop it now what the leopard is saying listen to me we are not against any development but face it instead of getting a guy a thousand acres give him 20 let him develop it give him another 20 let him develop it but you don't you don't bequeath to him a thousand acres in, in one go. You True. can't. You should not. Now, you say the argument is, oh, the land is there, it's not doing nothing. Which, again, is a futile, is a futile argument. Land is not an infinite thing. What about the 40,000 people here? Suppose they, they, want to, they want to come back to St. Lucia. Where right. would you put them? Right. What about your children and your grandchildren? So even though land today may not be doing anything in 20 years it's it's changed so to to the argument that the land is idle land can never be idle land is idle at a particular point in time <coughs> so you have this massive project and up to this day there has not been a consultation with the opposition i wrote the prime minister and i'm not and i'm not dealing with my dirty my dirty linen in public I'm speaking mm -hmm. facts to St. Lucians who want to know what's happening in their country. I wrote the Prime Minister. He hasn't even responded to my letter to say, yes, acknowledge receipt of your letter. I wrote him to ask him, listen to me. People have concerns about, people have concerns about what's happening with the 1,000 acres of land. They have concerns. Sure. There's an agreement which you did not put in public. Again, it was leaked. 
<laughs> so okay, the, yes. the so you're saying that the information about the DSH was leaked to the public. The agreement. The agreement. Yes. Okay. So um, this is this is a proposal that came about with I guess it was first put through to to um, SLP, mm -hmm. but the then prime minister, along with his cabinet of sixteen members. No. This, not the cabinet is not six. The cabinet was, I think, ten. Ten. Ten or nine. The cabinet. Okay. The cabinet. Right, right, there right. Were Eleven elected members. True. The cabinet was having okay. ten. So y'all, I mean, obviously, as you stated, y'all were not for the the sale of so much land. No, no. Here's what we said. We said, listen to me. Let's discuss it mm -hmm. because there are sensitive issues. I'll give an example. The Bosejo agricultural farm must, must must be removed. Okay. As the meat processing plant must must be removed. Okay. Farmers who make their livelihoods on the land must be removed. They are sensitive issues. There's something called the equine disease free zone, which says that if you want to bring horses of a particular particular calib caliber, caliber, they must they, they, they can't be any animals, etc. Three kilometers near the stables where you have them. Right, okay. It's called the equine disease free zone. There are serious issues that need to be discussed. You understand? So we are saying, listen to me. You you came with with with, with, with your plants. Let's let's talk about it. Let's bring in the farmers. Let's bring in the environmentalists. Let's bring in the 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 the, the, the opposition. Let's bring in the landowners. Let's bring in the business owners, and let's discuss it. All we see is plans. So, All we see is drawings. So that was your that was our proposal. That was your proposal yes. to them to bring in the opposition and Let's, some of the persons who would probably be affected. Mm, yes, yes. Okay. Right, but it does. It hasn't happened. You understand? So, um, that is so. So what's happening now is that we find ourselves in a situation where only what we hear from the government is plans. Mm -hmm. Every day they come in for different set of plans, computer drawings. Of good buildings, we have about marinas, we have about the airport being being taken over. We hear we, we, we hear all, all, all about these things, right? So all we say is let's consult and let's talk about it. I mean, I would think that um this would have definitely been the, the, the way to go. I mean, if it's going to affect all of those persons. It will. I mean by a right the um decision they should have had a say in terms of the decision. At least a discussion. True. Um, I guess we we sort of press for time. Yes, so we have this town hall meeting at six o'clock. Okay, I don't know how far okay. I'm from how far I'm from here, but I don't. It's not that far. Not that far. Uh, yeah, it's not far from okay, here. Right. So um, I'll ask about the citizens by investment program. Mm. I mean, there are some contentious um, policies, Very contentious. which we would like to explore. Um, what is what is the current issue with the CIP under the UWP that is concerning to the country? Okay, first of all, the CIP. When the CIP has been initiated, we called in the opposition. Okay. There was a task force that included a member of the opposition. The leader of the opposition was written to say to me, why don't you appoint someone to come, let's talk about the CIP. Because passports are very emotional. Your passport is, you see your passport is something that people cherish their passports, they hide it. True. When, when, I mean, your parents get a passport on the, on the bed, you know, they, on the mattress. <laughs> so, we said, there are scores of people in the world who want a second passport. Mm -hmm. So, when we, we did the CIP, we were the last to, to in, implement the CIP. We said, let the passports be a tool for investment. Okay. So we said, listen to me. We're only going to issue 500 passports per year. Mm -hmm. To get a passport, you must have a net worth of at least 3 million US dollars. And your minimum investment must be 300,000 US dollars. Okay. That were the requirements on which you had a passport. So that our passport would be a prestigious thing. And our passport would not be something that, you, that is dealt with willy-nilly something you just sell and trade in because that is your 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 people's both right their passports the government without consultation remember when we implemented the cip we involved the opposition in the committee that decided they prepared a report and the report went to parliament 
cabinet first and parliament for acceptance. They changed it and we heard it on the radio like anybody else. In fact, it was announced by someone who was not even in the government that we should have changed the CIB program. <laughs> okay. okay. And the government wants to just accept it. Here you are. So what, hap what happens now is that anybody with 100,000 US dollars who goes through their due diligence can get a passport. So that's what that's the value of your passport now, hundred thousand US dollars. You understand? So we 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 oppose it. We think that the CIP is a program that must remain a selective program. It must be at the highest levels, the highest levels of due diligence, etc. When we believe that unless that happens, the government we can't support the CIP in its present form. Okay. Um. I'm not sure if you're able to take any questions because of the fact that we're pressed for we time. Have to leave, but mm. but um, my last question to you would be: um, What is your, what is the SLP's view of the current UWP government and its policies? Oh, we think that the government has lost many many opportunities to advance the country. We think the government hasn't settled. They haven't accepted the fact that, that they are in government and the opposition will talk and the opposition will exist. I don't think they've understood that the opposition will never disappear. The thinking of that you can crush opposition, it never happened. There's, no, there's opposition in North Korea, much mm -hmm. of in Lucia. So you can never crush the opposition. So True. to believe you'll crush it, that, that will, will not happen. I think the government has, has lost many opportunities. I think the government is starting from where, from the beginning, where there was already a, a, a start, the Grosley Highway, the, the Hiwanora Airport uh, uh, development, the Viewford Ad Administrative Building, the Sufres Square, all these projects were ongoing. The government stopped them, the LED program. So the government wasted a lot of opportunity. So we find ourselves starting back things that could have been advanced. Okay, okay. So I think the government wasted, wasted opportunity I think that the government should have built on what they found and the country would have benefited more. Okay. Um, I said that was the last question, but let me just ask you this one last question. As it pertains to unemployment, I mean, this is a very delicate um, subject because, I mean, a lot of the young people, I mean, uh, going back earlier when you stated that this is one of the primary reasons why you all lost the general elections, people were frustrated I think the Prime Minister said that there has been a decrease in unemployment and, and the economy has somewhat picked up a bit. Um, what do you have to say I'll to tell you that? What, if there's a decrease in unemployment, I'll be the happiest person out. Because <laughs> every day, people come to my constituency, I want a job. Get a job for me, please. So every day. Okay. Why are you saying the opposition would not want employment to, 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 lower, to come down? True. We would have loved employment. In fact, we're striving for full employment. Mm -hmm. But fact is, unemployment is still too high. Fact is, there are still too many young people out of work. And fact is, we have to do something because in spite of the Prime Minister's pronouncements, unemployment is very high and we have to find ways and means of engaging our young people to reduce the level of unemployment in the country. Even though it's going down, if it's going down, I'd be very happy. I'd be very happy about that if it's going on, but I think it's too high, and we have to take measures to further reduce the level of unemployment of unemployment in the country. Okay, so I mean, there you have it, people. I want to thank you again, Mr. Philip J. Pierre, for coming through, for giving us your time. I do. On the, I do hope that our viewers, all 124 of you. We're able to take in some of what the um, minister said and y'all are able to look at what y'all know and, and come to a viable solution as to whether or, or what, how do we move forward, you know? So again, the, the agenda here was for us to understand from the opposition side of things how they believe that we can move the country forward and some of the struggles that we face and why certain things were not done under the SLP administration. So again, on behalf of Watch Radio NYC, 
It was a pleasure having you. I wish you all the best as the opposition leader. Whatever you decide to endeavor in, be it political or otherwise, I wish you nothing but the best. And again, we I speak on behalf of the people of St. Lucia. I want to thank you for coming through. It was greatly appreciated, your time and everything here today. Um, so, you want to take at least one call? Well, I, I, I want to really thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. I wish we could have some more time. You know, have a meeting at six. I understand that. And, for uh, time. But I'm, I'm very happy to, to be here. And I want, to make it, I want to make it clear. The opposition does not want St. Lucia not to do well. The, St. the opposition wants St. Lucia to prosper. The, St. the opposition wants the best for St. Lucia. The opposition wants all our people to, have to lead a life of fulfillment. True. That's, what, that's what we want for ourselves. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that we must remain quiet. True. That doesn't mean we must allow a lack of accountability or lack of transparency. That doesn't mean we must allow the, uh, any government. And that, and that is a duty that all citizens have to be watchdogs for the, for the people when, for all governments. So I really want to thank you for having me. And I want to reiterate that we are not on a path of destroying St. Lucia. We are on a path of, of building St. Lucia, but that's our point of view. And we believe many things are happening that are not that are not sound and we're going to talk about it it's our job because 37,000 solutions voted for us to do exactly what we're doing but okay. we're not a path on a path of destabilization neither only a path of wanting destruction for our country and i want to thank you very much i want to thank every, everyone here for having me i mean uh, i wish i can come back at some point if, if you if you if you do if you don't want me to come yes. but i think i want to thank you very much for, for being here i mean of course i mean there is no way we could decline a sit down with with the minister of the opposition so i mean i'm extending the invitation on behalf of watch radio you are more than welcome to job by whenever I think you, you guys are, are doing a very good job to keep people informed and i'm very proud of of solutions. Two chances at least. My beer could top over your cafe is it la Naswati Tut Moon and New York. And said, Lissy, no eme saw cafe, Pujan said, Lissy. On Shai Moon said, Lissy, Yoka, Yovle, Tut Manye, Yoka, Yoka Viv, Silla Jean Kigavini, Sot Zot and New York. Okay. Ek no eme sa, Ek no ve, Shwati Zot. On bon l'année, parce que l'année a juste commencé. Oui, et oui. Toujours, ni sent ici à l'idéo. Et même sent ici, parce que nous sommes gens sent ici, nous aimons le pays. Même, je vais essayer mes petites hands et mes my, 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 <laughs> my, my um, um, créoles, vous savez. So, um, nous voulons oui, remercier pour venir ici à Jodia. Nous apprécions ou, ou spendre pour nous Jodia. I mean, it was a pleasure. I think the viewers, a lot of them are, are grateful for this discourse. I mean, viewers, there you have it. At the end of the day, we're going to say, people are going to say what they have to say. They're going to lie. And, we, and we, we believe in free speech. Eh? True. We, we live in a, a democracy. Everybody can be for. You must have free speech. You right, must have right. discourse, dialogue, and, and, and et cetera. I mean, I mean, there is information that is out there where you, the viewers, have the right to educate yourself. There are certain things that, that you all are able to get. And, and so, again, we thank you for, for, for this opportunity. I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. And I wish you a great day also. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much.